this, this may be the most important decision on separation of powers, presidential power in the history of the court. It's never been addressed before. You are a witness to history, and I encourage you to read this decision completely. It vindicates President Trump. A lot of the issues about what the founders were worried about were covered by the Supreme Court in the term that most recently closed. And the biggest issue, at least when it came to government corruption, I would submit, is the ruling that vindicated uh, President Trump and may upend all of the prosecutions against him, which was the immunity uh, ruling by the Supreme Court of the United States. And I uh, got into it a little bit on uh, Fox Business the other day in terms of uh, discussing it. Let's go to a quick summary when, in my discussion with Char Charles Payne. This feels like maybe the Supreme Court has taken it upon themselves to take back, uh, you know, the three branches of government, right, to take back what rightfully belongs to judicial and legislative branches, and, and that they've somehow lost over the years. Just your thoughts on that, just a sort of rebalancing in my, in, in, of, the, of the way the founders, the, the structured... Uh, you know, our government, our system of government. Well, you know, it's interesting. The left is complaining about the president uh, not be, you know, having these extreme powers to do whatever he wants. And then they attack the Supreme Court for curtailing the executive branch's powers to arbitrarily make up rules as they go along in regulatory areas, not subject to court scrutiny as they should be under our constitutional system. And then, of course, you'd have the jury trial uh, rights uh, asserted on behalf of those victimized by the administrative state. So in many ways, these are big victories for civil liberties. And you know, the separation of powers, the president being allowed to be president, the Congress being allowed to be Congress, the courts being allowed to be courts, those were set up by our founders to protect our liberties. Yes. So this is a way to protect our constitutional system and you know, I just hope that Garland reads the writing on the wall, shuts this down. Frankly, that case in Miami may go, uh, uh, go out as well, given his decision-making on the documents occurred when he was president. Yeah. So uh, this immunity case by the Supreme Court is one of the most important cases the court has ever issued. And I don't say that lightly. No president has ever been prosecuted for his official acts while in office. And that was the question before the court. Could a former president be prosecuted for his official acts while in office? It's never happened before. And President Trump and his defenders, and I, and I count myself among those who thought he had the better argument, was that for the, under our constitutional system, you can't prosecute a president for being president of the United States. It's pretty darn simple. And the Supreme Court largely agreed with me. This was the statement I issued. I, I don't know, did we pull up the statement? I think it's worth pulling up. We're kind of summarized the debate on the issue, and it was, a, as I note in the statement, it was a, it was a common sense ruling. And of course, the left went apoplectic about it. Apoplectic? Yeah, apoplectic. Yeah. Uh, now I sound like Joe Biden. Today's common sense Supreme Court immunity ruling it wasn't today. It was last week. Is a victory for former President Trump, the U.S. Constitution, and rule of law. The Biden administration's political decisions to try to put Trump in jail for simply being president was unsurprisingly rejected. Make no, no mistake, the Supreme Court is imposing a virtually insurmountable burden on Jack Smith in his vicious pursuit of Trump over the election and document disputes. The unprecedented charges against Trump were frivolous to begin with, and after that decision should be shut down completely by the Justice Department. So that was a big victory, and I want to spend some time uh, with you on the case. And this is the, this is the uh, opinion. It is a total of, oh, well, I can't do the adding. Anyway, it looks like it's well over 100 pages. And so the syllabus up front summarizes. I encourage you, to, by the way, to read these Supreme Court decisions. Now, I'm going to read you a little bit of them, but read them all. This decision has important material in it by uh, Justice Thomas about the special counsel. Maybe I'll talk about that in a future update. And Chief Justice Roberts has an excellent decision. Uh, the crazy uh, dissent in 
in part by Justice Sotomayor, even though it has some outrageous material in it, there's some interesting law in it, and it's, you know, you should read the dissents and understand what the other side is, because sometimes the other side has interesting points that make you think, oh, well, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe this decision isn't as good as I think it is, or it helps you rethink your position and such. So uh, if you're a student of the Constitution or you love the Constitution, these Supreme Court decisions usually are an accessible way of understanding these, these big debates. And don't trust the media to describe them fairly to you. I mean, practically speaking, they can't even if they wanted to, given the time constraints and, 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 and uh, constraints in how much they can convey in a print publication or even online. So, you know, do, do the homework yourself for the Constitution and your republic. So in the beginning of the case, uh, in the beginning of the opinion, there's a syllabus, which kind of is a summary of the holdings in the case. And um, let me read you a little bit part of the syllabus. It held, under our constitutional structure of separated powers, the nature of presidential power entitles a former president to absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for actions within his conclusive and preclusive a constitutional authority, and he is entitled to at least presumptive immunity for, from prosecution for all his official acts. There is no immunity for unofficial acts. Why on earth would anyone be upset by that conclusion? I don't know. So if you do something outside the law, unofficial, that has nothing to do with your office, you can be prosecuted. If you do something within your capacity as president, that someone argues violates the law. I don't know who's in a position to argue that since it's the Justice Department, which is an organ of the executive branch. I mean, the left wants, the, wants us to prosecute or be able to prosecute former presidents every time they disagree with them politically on the exercise of their official acts because so many official acts by the president are disputed. And if you're doing something that is overturned by the courts, arguably you're doing something, let's say Biden's uh, student loan programs, where he was spending money that he wasn't authorized to spend to forgive tens and hundreds of billions of dollars in student debt. Those were overturned, or at least partly overturned by the Supreme Court. He continues to assert the right to do that and he keeps on doing it. Under their theory, he should be prosecuted. Of course that can't be the case. If a court overturns and disagrees with your exercise of your official power, that makes you subject to criminal prosecution? It's absurd. And I thought, and I encourage you to read the full case, because I'm not gonna go into the justifications that Chief Justice Roberts, who wrote the decision, went into. But I do want to describe how it impairs the lower courts from prosecuting Trump in the current cases that he's facing. And this is what Chief Justice Roberts wrote. In dividing official from unofficial conduct, courts may not inquire into the president's motives. So to the degree there's an argument whether something's official or unofficial in any of these cases, they can't bug the president about what he was thinking or his people close to him basically just harass the president to question what he was doing as president of the United States. Such an inquiry would risk exposing even the most obvious instances of official conduct to judicial examination on the mere allegation of improper purpose, thereby intruding on the Article II interest that immunity seeks to protect. And Article II references the, references the article in the Constitution that provides for a presidency and delineates his powers under, the, um, um, under our Constitution. Indeed, quote, it would seriously cripple the proper and effective administration of public affairs as entrusted to the executive branch of the government if in the exercising of the functions of his office, the president was under an apprehension that the motives that control his official conduct may at any time become the subject of, of inquiry. The thus, we thus rejected such inquiries in Fitzgerald, which is a prior case related to these issues. The plaintiff here, 
there, excuse me, the plaintiff there contended that he was dismissed from the Air Force for retaliatory purposes, reasons. The Air Force responded with the that the reorganization that led to his dismissal was undertaken to promote efficiency. Because Fitzgerald's th under Fitzgerald's theory, an inquiry into the president's motives could not be avoided, we rejected the theory, observing that inquiries of this kind would be highly intrusive. But bare allegations of malice should not suffice to subject government officials either to the cost of trial or to the burdens of broad-reaching discovery. And you know, in our experience, and, I, and I, I'll defer to the lawyers in describing correctly what I'm about to describe to you informally, if you don't like what a federal government official does, you can mount what is called uh, a, a Bivens action, right? And, and you basically say, uh, they broke the law, uh, and uh, they did it in an extrajudicial, or excuse me, extra, uh, uh, in a way that is beyond what the law allows and what their office, uh, beyond the powers of their office. I guess that's my way of saying it. And, and, and it's not even a Bivens claim. You can file all sorts of other claims against government officials at the federal level over violations of your rights or claims you have against them. And you're supposed to go through a process before that person is held personally liable, potentially in court, to ascertain whether or not they were doing simply something that arose from the simple exercise of their job duties and responsibilities as a government official. So you can't even get to that next step to sue them and bring him into court unless you figure out whether they did something in their personal capacity or official capacity. And so to apply that in the criminal context of the, context of the President of the United States seems to me pretty darn simple, doesn't it? But the President has a little more protections than your average bureaucrat. So just because you don't like what he did, as just Chief Justice Roberts says, you just can't go in there and start harassing him. This is what drives the left crazy here. Nor may courts deem an action unofficial merely because it allegedly violates a generally applicable law. For instance, when Fitzgerald contended that his dismissal violated various congressional statutes and thus rendered his discharge outside the outer perimeter of Nixon's duties, it was a case against Nixon, we rejected that contention, the Supreme Court did. Otherwise, presidents would be subject to trial on every allegation that an action was unlawful, depriving immunity of its intended effect. And then later he gets into the core cases or the core issues at issue here. And so these are the issues that the lower courts are gonna to have to figure out given the immunity fight that has uh, given the immunity decision that was just issued. So Chief Justice Roberts and the majority, 6-3, said the president is presumably immune on the issues for which he's being charged as it relates to January 6th. Specifically, uh, his communications with the vice president that they're trying to outlaw and say, well, he was doing that in his private capacity. And obviously the court said, well, the only two nationally affected, nationally elected government officials in the country, their communications presumably have something to do with the powers of the presidency, so not so fast. Again, presumptively immune. You can't go into the president's motives, and nor can you, according to Roberts, use other official acts by the president as evidence against him in these fights about whether another act is official or unofficial. So I don't know how they're gonna beat, the, beat Trump on that. And then the issue of uh, the, the electors and his work on the electors. The Biden Justice Department goons are saying that, oh, that's completely private. And the Supreme Court noted, well, Trump says he had, he's president. He had a right to, as president, figure out whether federal election law was being affected and being advanced through the Electoral College deb debates. How does how, how that overcome? You just can't say it's personal. 
the presumption is he's immune. So as far as I'm concerned, that case is over. The case in Florida, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, is over as well. That's over the sham documents issue. I mean, the decision to keep those records was made according to the Justice Department when Trump was president. It's an official act. Up in New York, that prosecution, the sham, um, Judge Ed Gorin's prosecution with Bragg, no, Judge Merchant's prosecution, excuse me, and Gorin is the other Democrat judge. Judge Merchant's prosecution, that conviction, that's done. If the Supreme Court's decision has any meaning, it's done. Because core aspects of the evidence, the core evidence was communications by the president in the Oval Office, acts in the Oval Office, presumptively official. And the, and, and the Supreme Court required an analysis before anything else happened. And that wasn't done. Judge Merchant just blew it all off when the presidential immunity issue was raised. Now that case has to be undone. At least that's the way I understand it. So all of those cases, and of course the Fannie Willis case in, in Georgia is an echo of the January 6th case up here by Jack Smith in D.C., So that's done too, or at least it ought to be done. So these cases should end, or at least in, in the least be upended by this Supreme Court decision. Now they're gonna keep on keeping on, right? But we'll see, maybe the Justice Department will uh, decide to follow the rule of law rather than politics and just shut it all down. And, and I don't know if I talked about this yet, I think I may have referenced it here, but the Fisher case is the case about whether this um, obstruction statute could be expanded to cover obstruction of an official proceeding, meaning by someone in going and protesting a uh, uh, Congress, as opposed to messing with documents. And that those cases were largely thrown out as well. That whole that whole abuse by the Justice Department was curtailed. Hundreds of people were unconstitutionally prosecuted. Two of those, two of the charges against Trump, uh, are tied to that case. Now the Justice Department hasn't announced whether or not they're going to drop them. They're pretending they're still covered. We're still valid even after that analysis, but we'll see. These cases against Trump are dropping. Now, the damage has already been done in many ways. I mean, this is somewhat not a surprise. The Supreme Court has been attacked because the left knew what was coming here. But in the meantime, Trump has been distracted, had to spend money, was held hostage up in New York. The Justice Department unconstitutionally, this is what the finding is, unconstitutionally prosecuted him for official acts for which he was protected. And they should have known better. They should have known better. More from Chief Justice Roberts. Because the left went crazy, literally went crazy in response to this very careful and moderate decision. I, I, I don't think it went far enough. I don't think Trump should be harassed at all for doing anything official while he was president or have to answer to any de his prosecutor in his own Justice Department. Right? The theory would, in my view, it would mean that he could be, so, under this theory, I'm worried that president even in office could be harassed. So it's not, it doesn't go as far as I want it to go. For the left, it was, they went crazy at it. They said, well, now people can go and have, presidents can go and have people killed, which is absurd. Look at this, Zoe Lofgren, a longtime Democrat in the House, said this about the Supreme Court decision. I guess, you know, theoretically, uh, President Biden, uh, acting within the scope of his official duties, could dispatch the military to take out the conservative justices on the court, and he'd be immune. I mean, you can see why it looks like I'm going to go crazy there. 
I mean, that's absurd. And unfortunately, she was getting this, that talking point from Justice Sotomayor. And here's what Chief Justice Roberts talked about, or responded to her with. Unable to muster any meaningful textual or historical support, the principal dissent suggests that there is an established understanding that former presidents are answerable to the criminal law for their official acts. Conspicuously absent is mention of the fact that since the founding, no president has ever faced criminal charges, let alone for his conduct in office. And accordingly, no court has ever been faced with the question of a president's immunity from prosecution. All of our nation's practice establishes on the subject, all that our nation's practice establishes on the subject is silence. Coming up short on reasoning, the dissents repeatedly level variations of the accusation that the court has rendered the president above the law. As before, the rhetorically chilling contention is wholly unjustified. Like everyone else, the president is subject to prosecution in his unofficial capacity. But unlike everyone else, anyone else, the president is a branch of government and the Constitution vests in him sweeping powers and duties. Accounting for that reality and ensuring that the president may exercise those powers forcefully as the framers anticipated he would does not place him above the law. It preserves the basic structure of the Constitution from which the law derives. The dissent's positions in the end boil down to ignoring the Constitution's separation of powers and the court's precedent and instead fear-mongering on the basis of extreme hypotheticals where the president feels empowered to violate federal criminal law. And it's interesting in those extreme hypotheticals, one of them wasn't, oh, we could have a president who decides to sick his Justice Department on his number one political opponent and try to jail him based on fraudulent interpretations novel interpretations, First Amendment protected civil discourse, jail him just like Putin might. Isn't that interesting that Justice Sotomayor didn't think that was a likely outcome of this immunity? Chief Justice Roberts ends the decision with this. The case poses a question of lasting significance. When may a former president be prosecuted for official acts taken during his presidency? Our nation has never before needed an answer. But in addressing the question today, unlike the political branches and the public at large, we cannot afford to fixate exclusively or even primarily on present exigencies. In a case like this one, focusing on transient results may have profound consequences for the separation of powers and the future of our republic. Our perspective must be far-sighted, must be more far-sighted, for the peculiar circumstances of the moment may render a measure more or less wise, but cannot render it more or less constitutional. Our first president had such a perspective. In his farewell address, George Washington reminded the nation that a government as of as much vigor as, a, as is consistent with the perfect security of liberty is indispensable. A government too feeble to withstand the enterprise, enterprises of faction, he warned, could lead to the frightful despotism of alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge. And the way to avoid that cycle, he explained, was to ensure that government powers remain properly distributed and adjusted. It is these enduring principles that guide our decision in this case. The president enjoys no immunity for his unofficial acts, and, does, and not everything the president does is official. The president is not above the law, but Congress cannot criminalize the president's conduct in carrying out the responsibilities of the executive branch under the Constitution. And the system of separated powers designed by the framers has always demanded an energetic, independent executive. The president, therefore, may not be prosecuted for exercising his core constitutional powers, and he's entitled at a minimum to a presumptive immunity for prosecution for all his official acts. The immunity applies equally to all occupants of the Oval Office, regardless of politics, policy, or party. I think that's pretty persuasive. This, this may be the most important decision on separation of powers, presidential power in the history of the court. It's never been addressed before.
you are a witness to history. And I encourage you to read this decision completely. It vindicates President Trump. It doesn't give him everything he wanted. It still subjects him to certain court scrutiny for his actions as president as they dispute the partisans in the Justice Department, whether he acted in a private or official capacity in some of these issues, but the presumptions with him in terms of immunity. And that's a significant hurdle for the prosecutors to overcome, and they may not even be able to begin the process given how far out of limb they are. These cases should never have been brought, and now the left has confirmed immunity for the President of the United States and his official acts. Now, Obama should be happy because he can't be prosecuted for some of the crimes he committed, I think, under the cover of official immunity, the sedition against Trump, the spying on Trump, Biden's invasion. He could have been prosecuted for that invasion under any fair reading of what he did as president, what his people did. Now it's going to be hard to prosecute him for that and other what I would consider to be criminal acts but for his official immunity. You don't hear the left talking about that. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like our video down below.